Monsters are real and ghosts are real too. They live inside us and sometimes they win. Stephen King. You're listening to Writing Roots, brought to you by Aspen House Publishing. Welcome to Writing Roots. I'm Lee Hole. And I'm Lee Esses. Now imagine this. It's a dark and stormy night in the year 1816. There's snow in June. You're an 18-year-old girl going with the man you would eventually marry to a dark and stormy castle. You enter a writing competition with the other members cloistered in this castle. You're writing something dark and terrifying. What do you write? Frankenstein. This year without a summer is a very fascinating point in history, but it was really the start of what we know as monster fiction. This is where we started to get modern monsters, not giant gods that we're fighting Grendel, but we're fighting a lot of the times man-made monsters. So you have Frankenstein, you eventually get Dracula and the Invisible Man. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, we've got some zombies going on. Even Edgar Allan Poe wrote this gothic horror flavor of humans going wrong. I personally love this time because you have the creation of the vampire. You have the creation of the werewolf from the Beast of Gevedon. You have a surge in stories about ghosts because of the spiritualism movement. Though we classify all of these in monster fiction, every one of these authors who created their own monster created their own little genre in the monster fiction. We've mentioned before that Frankenstein is a telling of man fearing his own creation. We have that same plot that goes through a lot of our robotics horror, goes through a lot of the Terminator and iRobot, these terrifying concepts of something that we create that turns against us. So many of these monsters, a lot of people believe, are a representation of societal fears in some way. So you have Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, where it's a fear of what a person can do if they let go of their inhibitions, if they stop stopping themselves from doing bad things, because that's the idea in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, is it's the same person who is both a normal person and the monster. A lot of the zombie fiction parallels time periods where there was a lot of fear of other. Frankenstein, on top of representing the fear of our own creations, is a representation of especially in the early 1800s, a fear of sciences and of the hubris of scientists who would take life itself into their own hands. You're so busy figuring out whether you could, you didn't stop to think if you should. Jurassic Park, which is another example of modern use of this monster fiction genre. A little bit later... With H.G. Wells and then most predominantly with Lovecraft, we have this cosmic horror of aliens, which are often treated like zombies in storytelling fashion. You have something out there in the unknown. Most of the unknown is in outer space or at the bottom of the ocean. Which is an interesting thing that a lot of Lovecraft's monsters that he created, the gods, come from the sea. They come from space. They come from these unknown and unexplored places in the world. I love monster fiction so much because it's so deep. And it had such a huge impact on the stories that we tell today. We have things like Godzilla and these ridiculous movies. Creature from the Black Lagoon and King Kong because of authors like Mary Shelley. So the 18th century in through the 1800s, we ended up 
collecting a weird amount of author celebrity. Prior to this movement, authors didn't get a lot of credit for what they were up to. Shakespeare was not the only person who wrote the Shakespearean plays. Even if you look at some of the older fiction novels, you know it by the name, not by the author, Don Quixote. And one fun thing about monster fiction is that it was like bedtime stories, but for adults. So last episode, we talked about the bedtime stories, and even though they might be morbid, they were for kids. Monster fiction takes some of those same elements and applies it to fiction for adults. This not only includes the existential dread that you have from Victor Frankenstein throughout the entire series, but the thrill of being afraid. Most stories up to this point, your main emotions are going to be happy. They're going to be, you know, some kind of triumph, some kind of education, sometimes humor. You have a little bit of tragedy in Shakespeare, but there's often a moral to that story. Reading and experiencing literature for the sake of feeling emotions like sadness or fear, traditionally negative emotions, is something fairly new starting around this era. This is also the beginning of sci-fi. Mary Shelley was not necessarily the first science fiction author, but she's credited with being the one that helped kick it off. And of course, nowadays, if I tell you my book has vampires and werewolves in it, which genre do you think it'll be? Urban fantasy, probably romance. So, of course, with this more emotional connection in our stories where we get to feel a variety of things while reading, we get a lot more tropes and complexities within the writing. We start to see a theme of life after death because that's what a lot of people fear is death and not knowing what's beyond. Ghosts start their story as dead. Vampires are undead. Zombies start their story as dead. Frankenstein's monster started its story as dead. A lot of these stories start with what we think is the end. This is also the beginning of an unsympathetic hero. If you read through Frankenstein, you don't really like the hero that much. Because he's not the hero. Being human is complex. Being alive means struggling with emotions and desires. This is kind of a reintroduction into storytelling of good versus evil, a true good versus a true evil. And often it's the duality within one person that is the potential for both good and evil. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is the perfect representation of this duality within. You also have these almost anti-hero characters starting to emerge. You have Van Helsing that is a truly terrifying human being, but at least he's on our side. A lot of the nature of beauty assigned with goodness starts to fall away with these monster fictions because you have things like the picture of Dorian Gray where he is beautiful and wonderful, but the inner ugliness starts to emerge and it's hidden away so people don't recognize it as evil, but that inner ugliness still exists in Dr. Jekyll as well as Mr. Hyde. Another common trope within this genre is the exploration of isolation and loneliness and what that does to a person, what that can impact in how they interact with the world, which is really interesting that this genre, this idea started with the year without a summer, where a lot of people were trapped and unable to really do much because it just didn't get warm enough, so there was a lot of feeling of isolation, desperation, and loneliness out there. Which I feel like we can connect with pretty well recently. Just a little bit. So, of all the things that we talked about, all the things that we can learn from monster fiction, I think the most important lesson that we can take and apply to our work 
is that the villains don't have to be human. They don't have to be the mustache twirler's obvious bad guy. Sometimes they are monsters, and sometimes it's the main character that's the real villain. Yeah, your first glance at Frankenstein, you think the doctor is the hero and the creature is the villain. But when you read it, you kind of realize the one who looks monstrous isn't the true monster. If you have any questions about monster and monster fiction, we did an entire series last October called Monster Mash, where we talked about individual monsters and how you can work them into your stories. And especially as we enter spooky season, enter October in Halloween time, maybe take a short story, look at monster fiction and its roots and dig out those elements of conflict and emotional complexity and apply it in your own writing. That will inevitably make you better. So go out there, have fun, explore monster fiction because it's so awesome. It's great. And of course, write selfishly. If you have a question or comment for our hosts or a topic you'd like us to cover, send us an email at writingroots at aspenhousepublishing.com or find us on Facebook by searching for Aspen House Publishing. 